sons and indirect heirs to their family's fortune. So a variety of available sources is also something worth considering because not every site has the same quantity, quality and format of sources. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses, but it's important to acknowledge every available source as well as the approaches of different disciplines. So I'll start off with artistic works, which are certainly a useful source which can depict design landscapes from the eyes of a contemporary. And of course, this is mainly the province of the art historian. So the analysis of individual sites from this period, however, is rarely achieved by art historians because individual site analysis using these sources alone can be quite problematic. Now, although we see a notable, noticeable rise in paintings being commissioned in correlation with the development of a state during this period, uh, events such as the Civil War caused disruption and obviously estates were ransacked and so these paintings are now extremely rare. So the example of Lanark Park in Wales um, is believed to be the earliest known painting to depict an entire rural estate landscape from a bird's eye view. And of course, this was painted in the 1660s, which is right at the end of my period. But we are fortunate nonetheless to find snapshots of design landscapes in portraits, such as in the background of the Capel family portrait, which is depicting the parterre gardens of Haddon Hall. But of course, paintings not only depicted observations of current landscapes, but also designs for new ones and even idealised landscapes which do not compare to reality. So at Morsham Hall, um, there was a sketch created in the 1630s, but the sketch does not actually correlate with a state map from the 1590s. So of course, um, I'm looking particularly at the Parterre Garden, which in the map is depicted to the south, but in the painting it's depicted to the north. So there is a chance that the garden was moved, but there's also the chance that it was never there and it was just placed for artistic effect. So as a result, these works provide quite a distorted view of the real landscape, not only in terms of its components, but also in terms of its replication of topography and the wider landscape context. So analysing the experience within these landscapes cannot be addressed using this source alone. So that's why rationalising and comparing the data with other approaches and disciplines is necessary. Now, some of the most prominent features in our landscape are architectural in nature, and architectural historians provide the majority of literature on the country house. So some country houses still survive today, like at Melford Hall, where the original architecture can be observed, but you can also compare it to a contemporary floor plan to provide evidence of the original interior design. So this provides architectural historians with a great opportunity to explore architectural theory and the processes of the architects themselves. But the problem is that the country house is one component of the estate landscape. We also have garden buildings, park lodges, gate houses, and even the villages and churches in the surrounding landscape. But of course, that means that there's less literature on these features. And of course, focusing on one particular feature means that observations, including those regarding visual experience, are limited to the house itself. Now, other architectural features beyond the country house are predominantly explored by landscape historians but I do see potential for growth in using approaches in architectural history within the wider landscape context. Garden history also has a similar problem, as the name suggests, it discipline focuses on the gardens, and that can already be problematic. Garden historians do provide an important contribution by exploring and understanding the symbolism and meanings within gardens using iconographic and literary sources. So this includes elaborate garden plans and gardening manuals. But beyond the garden, to the spatial arrangement of gardens within the wider context of design landscapes is often absent from these discussions. And therefore, concepts of experience are also limited to the gardens themselves. Now, of course, another problem is that these gardens were replaced by new styles of landscape design. But certain features such as this fountain from Oxney still survive. But of course, it now resides in a different location at Lickling Hall. So there has been this misconception that gardens could no longer be seen today, but that was before acknowledging the works of other disciplines, such as archaeology. Now, of course, we typically associate archaeology with ancient civilizations, and of course, that's where the majority of the literature resides, including experiments in phenomenology and the experiences within the landscape. 
But the remains of design landscapes also exist in the form of archaeology, and that's where we can find some good evidence of these landscapes. So in the, the 1590s, 1980s, uh, the garden archaeology was first introduced, um, and large-scale excavations were conducted at the Privy Garden in Hampton Court. Now, the aim of these excavations was to recreate the garden from the time of William III, which is in 1702, but they nonetheless could establish a timeline of activity, such as the remains of a bit of Tudor mosaic flooring, which was left behind as rubble. But what's interesting is that in the top left corner is a later hole dug to build, um, to plant a tree to create topiary. So archaeology came as a revelation, but of course archaeology was not limited to excavations. Um, so we have earthworks of terraces visible at Stiffkey, but also surviving foundations at Hoxton Hall visible as crop marks on aerial photography. So this approach was not readily accepted by scholars because they were drawn more um, the certain amount of professionalism with large scale excavations. But with the emergence of work in earthworks and aerial photography, but also other non invasive methods such as geophysics, um, it kind of opened up access to archaeology to other scholars. And that's where landscape history comes in. So by utilising the approaches of the aforementioned disciplines and a variety of sources, um, we add to the breadth and depth of analysis of design landscapes by creating a more well-informed multidisciplinary approach. And together with our interest in scale of analysis, so beyond the house and the radiating garden schemes around it, but is a wider landscape and the regional landscape context where the site resides. This approach altogether provides a more supportive foundation to analyse how these landscapes were experienced. So the next stage is to use computer science to synthesise all the available evidence and rationalise it, but also to combine the strengths of the approaches of the aforementioned disciplines. So GIS is becoming popular within spatial and digital humanities. And as I previously demonstrated, GIS is great to identify trends and regional variations, but it also has the capabilities to improve individual site-based studies. So it's the best opportunity to combine, compare and rationalise data to create one cohesive interpretation of an individual design landscape. So as the map on board shows the first one, um, that's just a snapshot of the sources that um, I used. But the fact is, if I put any more in there, it would have looked really, really messy. And I think that's partly the point, is that there is a lot of data, but to try and see it all and try to convey that to others is quite difficult using the sources individually. So by extracting the data from estate maps, archaeological plans and architectural plans, but being corroborated using modern OS maps, as well as listed buildings, ancient tree surveys and historic environment records, we can fill the gaps in the landscape context and extract the data using polygons. But this can all be stored in a geo database, which can then act as a record of the sources that I've used. So as the second map shows, I've created um, a focus area of about four miles in diameter to accommodate for the wider landscape context and its impact on design landscapes. So now the 2D environment is complete, it was then necessary to use the data in a 3D environment for certain reasons. So the main reason to um, use 3D over 2D is the presence of the z-axis. Um, so 3D more closely resembles how the landscape was perceived compared to 2D. So this is a 3D version of a 2D map of the data I've extracted from Hoxton Hall. And as we can see, it looks quite flat and not entirely realistic. So the first thing I need to do is add topography. Um, landscapes definitely aren't flat. Every hill and every valley is unique to every location, so which goes back to my regional approach. And of course, we are trying to rectify where contemporary landscape pa paintings have potentially distorted the natural topography in their depictions. So the data used for this topographical base map is from LIDAR surveys um, to an accuracy of about two metres. Um, so, of course, this is better displayed and understood in 3D GIS. 
And then we need to add the surface features. So from artificial to natural features, they collectively affect the composition of the landscape and the experience within it. So it's important to display both topography and surface features collectively. But of course, despite the 3D nature of GIS polygons, there is something important missing. Now, certain sources may be able to provide us with the location of features which can be easily used in GIS. But there are other more descriptive and detailed sources which GIS is less able to replicate. So these are examples of different forms of evidence which contain information about colour schemes, building materials, heraldic designs and gardens. So GIS cannot capture the details to the level of accuracy that we would as closely as possible replicate what was once perceived in reality. Now Esri, the developers of ArcGIS, created a new data format called Multipatch. And the purpose of the multi-patch was to enable the importation of 3D models created from external software, such as CAD software. So CAD was first developed to enable the creation of single 3D models instead of the previous amalgamation of several 3D drawings in the past. And like GIS, CAD responds to the same X, Y, Z axes, but it also provides a similar platform to rationalise and amalgamate the data into one coherent interpretation. So this is where I started for my master's dissertation using Trimble SketchUp. So I self-taught myself how to use it, and it was a relatively simple and user-friendly interface, so it suited the purposes at the time. But for my PhD, I wanted to explore other possible software, ultimately improve my skills, but also to reach the standard of modelling that had been accomplished within the heritage sector so far. So this is what I've created um, using 3ds Max, which is typically used for designing computer games. It's a bit more advanced and more complicated in terms of this interface, but I was fortunate enough to receive training in 3ds Max, along with certain image editing skills from a 3D modeler who, alongside one of my professors, has worked on creating models of heritage sites such as Leeds Castle. Now, of course, if their work is currently on display within their exhibitions and is used to improve visitor experiences of heritage sites today, then this text should also be beneficial for my research and understanding contemporary experiences. But another reason to use 3ds Max was because its developer, Autodesk, is continuing to develop a strong partnership with Esri between their GIS and CAD softwares. So this provides a perfect pairing for this research in terms of current methodologies, but also more importantly in terms of continuing maintenance and support which is important and valuable when looking to the future. But of course, CAD models have been criticised as being more than, little more than attractive images. So using 3D for 3D's sake, when a 2D environment is perhaps more appropriate in certain cases, and 3D has nothing more to offer. But I think part of the reason for that criticism is the way that CAD is designed. Because the purpose of CAD is to create, edit and visualise data it was not originally designed to conduct further analyses. So that's why using 3D models and GIS together is useful. Because 3D GIS is one of those few systems which is able to provide a solution to both 3D representation and spatial analysis. But CAD is not the only 3D modelling software that is compatible with GIS. If you're lucky enough to have a surviving artefact, you can use photogrammetry to capture it and import it into 3D GIS. But 3D GIS at this level is particularly prominent among archaeologists looking to recreate ancient sites. But within the context of design landscapes, it has not been used for both 3D representation purposes and spatial analysis until my master's degree. So 3D models can now be part of the GIS recreation. So we now have the foundations to analyse how design landscapes were experienced within 3D GIS. Now, I've achieved this using two different GIS tools to analyse the popular concepts of prospect and prospect. I mean, promenade. So I'll start off with prospect, so the act of viewing a landscape from a static vantage point. So using the future analysis tool, you can visualise the visibility of the landscape from a particular location. Now, future analysis relies on topographical data to calculate visibility. So this is an example from the Piano Nobile, or the first floor of Morton Hall. So the lighter areas are where things are visible, 
and the darker areas are invisible. Now this technique has been used in numerous landscape studies, including Bronze Age barrows to medieval castles and even 18th century design landscapes. But they all do this within 2 GGIS to produce something like this. But there are problems that these studies have not accounted for. And the first is that the data sets that we capture are of course of our current landscape. And so the data is not truly representative of the landscapes in the past. So these previous studies have used the modern data without editing it to get rid of any obviously inconsistent features. So for example, um, I've highlighted a motorway. Now we cannot necessarily be certain of every change in the landscape, but I'm pretty sure motorways didn't exist in Elizabethan times. So I've attempted to rectify this by editing the data to ensure the results are more representative of the time period I'm researching. And secondly, um, they also did not account for adding in contemporary features. So everything from hedgerows to houses to woodland. So using my polygons that I created earlier, you can convert them into raster data and input um, height value to then merge it into the topographical data. And then you can ultimately replicate the 3D GIS environment as a digital surface model or DSM. I think it was just because you had the menu. Ah, there we go. <laughs> um, so as you can see, if we conduct the same um, analysis again, the results are very, very different. And then we can overlay these results onto the 3D GIS environment for analysis. So we can visualise what was visible and what was invisible, both of which would have had bearing on experience. And of course, this is all within a navigable environment, so you can highlight or zoom in on particular details up close, or you can see the wider impact across the landscape. Now, as for promenades, I'm recreating these using animations. So we're starting to see great progress in animation technologies, and it has the potential to be of benefit for analytical purposes. So in the uh, context of design landscapes, we are only seeing these in the capacity of creating public displays and exhibitions without scope for analysis. But we're also seeing um, a lack of inclusion of the wider landscape in these animations. They're only focusing on what was visualised in the immediate grounds. Now, animations are also possible within CAD environments, but when integrated into the GIS environment, the same data set can be used for both animations and viewshed analysis. So I'm not only trying to demonstrate the versatility of 3D GIS, but also avoiding the risk of distortions between different data formats and inconsistencies between software. So in this example, we see the parterre garden's geometric design from an elevated position, the heraldic colours of the family painted on the waterways, as a previous statement from the account stated. And you can also see that the heights of the walls surrounding the gardens would not have stopped the views over the surrounding pasture and meadowland. Now, whilst each method is useful in their own respects, there is an aspect that neither can achieve, and that is they cannot interpret the data. Now, in the words of a medieval philosopher, Meister Eckhart, subtract the mind and the eye is open to no purpose. So if we are to understand what was experienced through sight, we need to recreate the minds of the landowners who created them. So for this method of interpretation, I'm using reception theory. It's a term used by literary historians involving how printed texts affected thoughts and behaviours of people. Now, literary historians do work on fictitious literature regarding landscape design, whether in prose, poems, plays or court masks. But there's also a wealth of documents in the form of factual material, whether in published works such as farming manuals and architectural texts, but also unpublished material in the form of letters and travel diaries. But these have only been examined and analysed in more recent years. So instead of critiquing the text themselves, I'm using it to bolster reception theory and therefore offer fresh and exciting new perspectives to the study of design landscapes. So as an example, this is the viewshed analysis from the gallery at Stiffkey Old Hall. Now I've highlighted an area of common land which would have been invisible from the gallery. Now texts from the period document that common land is where the poorer members of this community reside, but they also say that they considered them to be vermin. 
So landowners ideally wished to enclose these areas of commons and turn them into private land for their own estates. And this appeared to be the case with Nathaniel Bacon, who owned Stiffkey, where it is recorded in his papers that he was accused of essentially jumping the gun and putting his sheep on the land of a common in Aylthorpe illegally. So the common at Stiffkey was not able to be enclosed until the 18th century. So it is possible to interpret that obscuring an unenclosed common from sight of the house prevented overlooking this area, which was full of vermin and likely considered unsightly. Now, although originating in literary history, art history can be used to assist in reception theory. Now, as previously mentioned, artwork cannot necessarily be reliable when recreating these landscapes in reality. But nonetheless, they are useful for interpreting these results because they do document what contemporaries consider to be ideal landscapes. And the landowners who commissioned them um, may have even sought to achieve it in reality. So this is a snapshot from an animation recreating the ascent of the Prospect Mound at Morton Hall. So I've highlighted the visibility of a church in the direct line of sight framed by woodland. Now, even the spire of a church visible within a scene was considered beautiful, and so the placement of the mound took advantage of that view. This was not only the case at Morsham, but also in the painting depicting Albury Park in Surrey. But of course, churches were more than just beautiful. They could also have a religious connection or act as a status symbol, or even convey a sense of familial lineage to the ancestors who were buried there. And that's why a more multidisciplinary approach, even within reception theory, is also important. But of course, we are talking more, not only just about what contemporaries responded to in word and image, but also by who and what they encountered through their social networks and experiences of other cultures on their travels abroad. So these are snapshots from the animation of the approach to the entrance of Stiffkey. Now I've compared it to Old Gorhambury House in Hertfordshire. So the architecture of Stiffkey resembles Gorhambury, which was the home of Sir Nicholas Bacon, who was Nathaniel Bacon's father. Now the reason why they look so similar is that the intended plan for Stiffkey was designed in 1574 by Nicholas for his son, and Nicholas also designed Gorhambury. But although due to financial difficulties, the intended plan was never fully executed, and so not only is a comparison between these two sites and these two people beneficial, but the use of GIS and 3D GIS enables you to switch layers on and off to see the transitional phases and possible ideas for these landscapes. Now, the main difference between Stiffkey and Gorhambury would have been the cultural aspects of the architecture. So Gorhambury contained Italian classical architecture in the form of Doric or Ionic columns seen in the left wing of this painting. And the stone used in its construction was imported from Normandy. Now these would all have indicated someone very well traveled with tastes in European fashion. But the site that Nathaniel eventually created by 1604 was very different. It was far plainer with no evident cultural influences and was instead focused more closer to home by using local flint and brick. So on the approach to these two sites, visitors would have had different notions, perhaps regarding their social standing, but also their cultural awareness of the people who lived there. So just to conclude um, with the aims of the talk, um, I hope that I've demonstrated the benefits of using a multidisciplinary approach and how technology has been used to achieve this. I also hope I've demonstrated the abilities of 3D GIS as both a 3D representation and an analytical tool. And I hope that my research will provide a better understanding of visual experience within design landscapes. And so I'll end on my final aim, which is rekindling research into design landscapes. But I don't just mean within the scope of my PhD research. Now that I have created this resource, I hope to share it with others, and it would be a shame to keep the data for myself. Now, of course, the main problem is that access to technology for a wider audience is difficult, whether in terms of the prices of licenses for the software or suitable hardware specification to run the software to begin with. So that's where WebGL can be used. Esri developed City Engine Web Viewer to enable 3D GIS landscapes to be visualized online. So I, to use this, I had to learn another technological skill, which was coding web development. 
So I was fortunate enough to be chosen as one of the 20,000 women being taught how to code with the Code First Girls initiative. So this enabled me to create this website, which I can then host my data. So I hope not only to make the data more accessible, but also to open up possibilities of crowdsourcing, public interactions and learning opportunities. So in conclusion, I hope that I've demonstrated the value of digital methods within this field to a wider audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a fascinating talk with a, a plethora of um, sources, information and approaches. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a very fruitful discussion. Um, questions? Yeah, fascinating talk. Sure, thank you. Um, I've never seen a view shared done about scale before. Uh, can okay. I ask, did you um, use both your topographical DSM and the um, CAD features that you mentioned? Are, are they both included in that? Or is it... um, well, what I tried to do is um, the CAD models aren't part of the DSM, but I tried to replicate it as best as I can as part of data. Um, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Justin, yeah, I've heard Justin have a few questions. Yeah, yeah, I might go for the, the slightly trickier one first, which is how how you, you've demonstrated wonderful technologies and how you've shown an amazing breadth of skills through this, you know, ten times more than most PhD students can get. Think. Um, but how is this fed back into the conclusions and arguments of your thesis? Which would you pick out one or two aspects particularly that have given you insights that would not have been possible using the more traditional mm. methods? Mm. You, you kind of introduced that, that aspect yeah. and I'm kind of looking for the conclusions. Yeah, I suppose the main reason for doing this was because none of these sites survive. And because no one's really delved into 3DGIS as a technique before, I guess it just provided an opportune opportunity. That's even a phrase. <laughs> um, so I hope that's what I've demonstrated in this. And I think that's probably my main conclusion is just to open up the possibility of creating a source that can then be used for analysis for not just me, but other people as well. So, it's the reconstruction of yeah i think it's the reconstruction features. but because gis is an analysis tool it was beneficial to demonstrate that it is versatile yeah and back to the sorry back to the regional <laughs> patterns did you mm -hmm. did you discover regional patterns did you i haven't done all the sites yet so i've done two sites completely three sites are at the beginnings of doing the cat reconstruction so I'll let you know <laughs> sorry that was a, a <laughs> <That's question. fine. laughs> uh, we've got a couple questions I'll, I'll start at the very back and then move forward go ahead thanks very much really yeah, pretty fascinating I've got two questions very sort of tangential maybe um, the first one is um, what these places are called listed and I just wonder if you're tempted by the idea to enrich the list and uh, upload 3D photographs and see the, the national list of now photographs of sites stories uh -huh. so which might be one interesting app to explore in terms of i, don't I didn't know that was a thing sets. but yeah no, no, no. i would definitely be interested in that yeah so if google enrich the list and i'll take okay. it start being inside and you can add stuff to you know, the listing uh, okay. description and play what not to drop over on insight and stuff and the second thing was about perception and other possible sort of uses of this sort of technology um and i was thinking and it's got to go to the opticians about how um, how one would have seen these places before you had to do some eyesight so is this, is this a way you can say this is what it might have looked like most people might have been struggling to see so this is why things would have been smaller yeah like, that's one thing and the other thing sort of being the, the interest of the animal the, the, the animal term i suppose and the role could you populate where animals are and arts within these landscapes and how that sort of history plays as well yeah um well with the animals um well, i tried to um within the database define that it's pasture land and that sheep would have been grazed there in the documents. Um, but to put tons of little sheep everywhere would probably be too much for GIS to handle almost. 
because um, there are quite a few places that would have been able to do that. Um, but it's certainly a possibility, perhaps within a smaller focus area, to do that. Um, and your first question to do with eyesight. Um, there is something that I haven't experimented with yet. But there's a transparency band which allows you to radiate from a particular vantage point um, the degradation of sight. Um, so you can adjust it if someone has particularly bad eyesight, you can adjust the parameters to make things less clear closer up. So there are experiments to be done with that. Um, I haven't tried them out yet, so I don't know how it works. <laughs> Okay, um, here and then there, and then we've got one online as well. Go ahead. Um, I love the models, but as someone who's done a little bit of JS, in, I guess, in the past, I'm wondering whether the data that underlies it supports everything that's being presented. And I guess I'm wondering, what is your process in terms of deciding when you have data coming from various different places, you have paintings, you have the map, you have archaeology, what is the do you have a sort of common denominator that you sort of settle on and you discard the really precise data and you and just go with the more general data? Or mm. do you think that we can go further and sort of use this as a kind of reconstruction tool? Is that what you're sort of proposing to do as well? Um, in terms of rationalizing the data, that's partly why GIS is useful because you can compare and overlap the data to find where common trends are. For example, there's a, um, with Moulton Wall, um, there's no evidence, obviously, but there was an archaeological excavation which would um, provide um, where the original wall foundations of the gardens were. And that's what would um, determine whether the painting was wrong or whether the map was wrong. But the map overlaid perfectly onto the archaeology. So it's, it is essentially just seeing those common trends and just doing the best you can. But with Mortimer, it is just archaeology, the painting and the map. That is it. So I am trying the very best that I can with the data I've got. But of course, you do have to give it a little bit of leeway that it is just an interpretation. So I'm trying to open up the possibilities of this research. But of course, things may change as new data comes to light. So there's something to bear in mind. And was there a second question? I've forgotten this. Well, I, I guess I, I would go from there to say, in a sense, do these models then represent your argument, your interpretation of the mm. history of the site? Is it, in a sense, the conclusion, the model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you mean. Mm. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's something worth thinking about. Yeah, I've never really thought about it like that, but yeah. We had this discussion, I think, also in the previous, sorry to about that, it was in a previous seminar, um, actually the last seminar, right, and the discussion also veered along these lines of what it was about maps um, and mapping and then to what extent then the map is always just a representation right. or an interpretation of something, a map is never, you know, just a map, there is a lot, a mm. lot that goes into it and so on, and that seems to be sort of like a similar mm. kind of discussion yeah. we could have about these. Extent. I suppose that's also part of a reason to do it. It's providing an opportunity for people to contest it if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone doesn't make the first step and do something in the first place, then there's no progress, essentially. So, yeah. yeah you mentioned um, phenomenology and yes. the sort of uh, experiential aspect of this. I guess one area where these sorts of reconstructions, visualizations, sort of run into that or collide with that in a way is the Privilege, privileging the visual, um, which is a function of 3D models, the internet, all these things. How would you draw on this tremendous range of sources that you brought together to kind of burrow into the kind of things other than sight that might be interesting in these landscapes? Mm. Um, there have been studies which have used 3D GIS in things like AR and VR, um, but also. Uh, augmented reality, which is um, through a screen on your phone, for example, but also virtual reality through headsets. Um, so work has been done with that before. And I think someone, I can't remember which study it was, but they also had a mask for scent, um, 
which would then spray whenever you walked into a particular area. Um, so there are possibilities to include other sensors, but just within the remits of my PhD, I had to choose wisely and focus on yeah, sight for now. <clears throat> Uh, we've got a question, uh, an online question from LD Beals. Um, to what extent uh, do you feel that visualization for analysis has been taken up by others in the digital humanities, and what are the main issues you face doing so? Hmm. Okay. Um, there have been some really good studies with visualizations. Um, I can name a few quite off the top of my head, including there's the Ancient Rome project, which is a fantastic 3D city of Rome from Roman times. Um, and that's all really fantastic and something that, as I can't remember how long the project's been going on for, but they've made really good headway in um, that space of time. But um, in terms of um, the advantages and disadvantages, something that Ancient Rome does really well is the level of detail and the ability to continue to um, test the data, essentially. Um, so that's something that I faced with my research because I've got such a limited time scale. As much as I want to be a perfectionist, I'm really good at being a perfectionist. Um, it's not necessarily possible um, within the PhD to be that specific and that data rich um, for every site. So I've done the best that I can, um, but I think that's something that um, we did actually discuss this in Eastern Arc talks was that within the PhD for digital humanities, do we need to consider providing longer PhDs to do data justice essentially? So I think that's probably the main disadvantage I would probably say, but in terms of the main advantage, um, the technology is very versatile and it can be adapted for different environments and for different people. And that just makes it a whole lot more accessible for others, not just within academia. So I think, does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Maybe? <laughs> I hope so. I'm sure Melody will. <laughs> if it doesn't, if it doesn't um, satisfy her, she's got a follow on. In, in she's got a follow on that side. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, plenty of things that could be asked here. One of the things with multiple sources. I've often wondered, if in, on the art history side, is to what extent some of the landscapes we look at are basically like estate agents' visualisations of things as yet unbilt. After all, the archives are full of architectural drawings of buildings that were never quite uh, realised. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've often wondered whether, uh, I'm trying to remember the same thing, Richard Brown, painter, that uh, whether he operated for uh, Capability Brown. Uh, so when Capability Brown went out and looked at things, then along came the artist and painted up as Capability Brown saw it would look like in 40 years, rather than when the trees were only two metres high or whatever. Mm. Uh, so, that, so that's one thing. The other thing I was wondering, which is more going forward, is are we, we going to the point where we could do things like taking Yang Kip's views of country houses and just scanning them in and then being able to automatically rotate them around and present them in 3D to compete with their deer and sheep and whatever mm. else they've got in the garden there. Is, is, is that becoming a possibility? Um, I'm not sure about the scanning thing, um, but I haven't specifically used John Kip and if just because they are 1700s, which yeah. is slightly outside of my period. Although we are still seeing some of those trends, they are not actually representative of the period I'm looking at. But I would actually be really interested to see if it is possible to have those images scanned and turned into 3D models. That would be really interesting. Um, I'm not sure what your first question was, though. Uh, it wasn't really. I was, I was just, just sort of just <laughs> putting in another uh, caveat for you to history, that it might be something that was going to happen rather than I see. what has actually happened. Um, yeah. that, that, uh, an example of uh, going to the gardens of something which was thought not to exist was the garden up at Lord Rochester at Petersham near Richmond, of which they Kip has got Kip's got beautiful engravings, very nice perspective, etc. But it was very sort of lavish and no one was quite sure whether it actually existed. And then a description of it turned up in a Dutch 
Traveller's journal, mm. and it did actually exist. So, you know, it, it can work, work both ways. You know, mm. the art history can either be something that never <laughs> wasn't quite there, and equally, the drawing of the garden can actually be what was there. So, uh, you know, you win some, you lose. <laughs> yeah. You're dealing with a lot of grey areas. Um, we'll go to the back. Yes, please. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious about your process in doing the research and how you manage all the different data that you have to deal with and keep that straight amongst your, uh, uh, with yourself as you're navigating these different um, softwares, mm. different versions of things. What strategies have you developed as a researcher to handle? Um, hmm. And have you thought about how you might make that data available for people in the future to take off this and do it for, you know, do more with it. I know you've mentioned okay. some of those things in mm. terms of the website, et cetera, but sometimes mm. data management also has to do with that. Yeah. So anything you can share on that would be great. Um, <clears throat> well, in terms of my process, um, most of the sites their data is um, quite easily accessible from archives, but in some cases um, they are in private management and so people aren't actually allowed to access it. Um, so in some cases I'm not actually able to see the archives that I thought I could because of that reason. Um, so in that sense I've done the best that I can through publicly accessed archives. Um, but that being said, um, with the 3D models, um, it is quite easy just to replace with a new model. Um, there's no kind of um, tricky way of doing it. It's simply a copy and paste kind of situation. Once something's placed where it should be, you can just stick a new one in if something's changed. Um, but I think the layering setup of GIS is really, really helpful just that you can get rid of a particular document if it doesn't particularly match anything, you can just test things out a little bit. Um, but I think where I start amongst all of that is actually just to look at the site itself as best as I can, because that does provide the best evidence in terms of spatial arrangements. So that's kind of the main starting point for me. And then if it just so happens that the archives then um, corroborate those stories or even provide a bit more information then that will be the next step and then 3D models after that. Um, but because of the database set up with GIS as well you can then keep track of any sources that you have used for those particular sites and if that changes you can then edit the data as necessary. So it's quite a good data management system in itself and then you, if I would had the website up you'd be able to click on each one of the options there and it would then provide you with all the data that I've used and where I found it so the record references in the archives or the website I downloaded a particular source um, so in terms of getting people access to that I hope that will be enough of an indication for them to do the research for themselves does that answer your question okay. yeah no I yep. mean <laughs> there's there's so many levels of depth you could go into yeah, yeah. in that realm of data mm -hmm. management and also um, file naming structures and all that yeah. uh, and potentially putting your the files that you created through the through ArcGIS and through CAD up onto a place where like GitHub will continue to exist. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> or, or it's whatever the next thing yeah. you have. You know, so I was just curious how you're thinking about that. It's yeah. great to know that basically the, the, the database is doing a lot of that for you mm -hmm. and that you're having some payoff in addition to the visualization and the analysis yeah. of the database that is also providing you with some of that um, citation management. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Could I just add to that? Mm -hmm. One of the things I find using ARC is that it generates such a complex element and multiple versions of files and layers and yeah. some things in toolbox will create a layer without saving it and sometimes it will create a whole 
mm -hmm. load of files. So it's actually the, the practical version control and file control, how you deal with that. Mm -hmm. Are you doing it in a file geo database? Are you using this ARC server and doing version control through that? Or the practical, how are you keeping track of all the stuff um, that ARC creates and inundates you with? Mm. Well, all of the landscape context stuff, which is just GIS polygons, that just goes in a separate shape files section. So they're all, it's purely just defining where they were. So there's no kind of further interactions with Toolbox to corrupt any data, I'm hoping. Um, with the models, they're all in a geo database, um, which is the only way that ArcGIS can handle the models. Um, so that's slightly more risky, I suppose, um, but um, it's the best way to achieve what I want to achieve. Um, but I haven't had any instances with any data corruptions or changes in files or anything just yet. So <laughs> I think it's been okay so far. Yeah, just thinking back to reopening GIS files from my PhD from seven or eight years ago. Um, the, the file links have been, been corrupted mm. and not remembering the exact query that I did to generate the map that there's mm. a printed copy of in the thesis and I can't replicate yeah. it again. Yeah. So like with the view sheds, there are so many settings you can tweak mm. with that. Do you document? Yeah, I do. It's perhaps a hint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, make sure. No, that will go in my methodology. Cubic convulsion setting on raster resolution. That's mm. all. That's all down. <laughs> the results can be so different. Yeah, they can. Such sort of things so make it yeah. I believe we have another question here at the front. Three. Yeah. Three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, three points. The, the picture that you said didn't match. Mm -hmm. Is it possible it was a mirror image that was reversed? Because it looked mm. like it was an engraving mm. that would make it back to front. And sometimes if people are painting pictures intended for engravings, the picture itself will be painted mm. back to front so that the engraver copies the picture and then it comes out the right way round mm. once it's engraved. Yeah. So that is something, you know, it could just yeah. be, it's like getting photographs that are the wrong way around. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is a possibility, um, but there are a couple of things that I also didn't mention about painting was that one, the entrance was to the south, where actually it was to the west, which is slightly different as well, but also it depicted a moat and according to sources from the 18th century, they really struggled to actually get water near the place in the first place during refurbishments, so that's also slightly sceptical that there was even a moat there as well, so there are reason other reasons why it was potentially not accurate mm -hmm. um but it was depicting the arrival of maria medici from france who was the mother-in-law of charles I, I think i've got that right um so what i think probably happened was the artist kind of embellished that particular meeting um to bring in all the pretty aspects of the hall into the painting which may not actually have been real so that's what i think probably happened <laughs> so you have other reasons for thinking the picture is wrong yeah. yeah um a second one you said that you had bigger estates or bigger houses where it was the richer soil mm -hmm. does that cause an effect is it because they've got the richer soil the landowner gets more income and is a richer landowner so he can build a bigger house mm -hmm rather than I'm going to build my big house on the rich soil. They've got the rich soil to start off with. Mm -hmm. That's possible, yeah. yeah. And my third one was just, um, you're talking about garden archaeology. Mm -hmm. I remember in 1967 they did garden archaeology at Fishbourne, uh, literally that Roman. Okay. Mm. But that was using not only the digging down to see where the trenches were and where the tree pits and things like that, but they did pollen analysis mm -hmm. to see what plants were there as well. Okay. So it does go back to say 1967 at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. I suppose I was just thinking in terms of 16th and 17th century. I didn't really think of Roman gardens actually. So that's actually interesting. Yeah.
We have opportunity for a few more questions if anyone would like. Yes, Can I ask uh, it's a slightly different direction, but uh, I was thinking obviously when you were showing all your uh, images um, and models um, that obviously um, something like uh, English Heritage or the National Trust, they would be very much interested in this mm. kind of work and so on. Is this something that they're doing already or that they're looking into? Are you aware of that? Because I'm thinking that they would surely have an interest in kind of having such models for their visitors mm. kind of to, to explore that or is that well I'm anything you're trying to work with Melford Hall for my PhD research and they've been very enthusiastic about what I'm trying to achieve um, but I'm not aware of other sites using 3D GIS mm -hmm. I know that they're doing GIS studies and of course they're creating 3D models but they're not using 3D GIS specifically mm -hmm. um, so that would definitely be something that I would probably be interested in is going to these sites and doing analysis yeah. for them, definitely. Any other questions? Well, that's one. Okay, then we'll go there. Yeah, go ahead. What would you like to see as the main publication from your PhD? <laughs> okay. um, ooh, that's actually a really tough question. I think probably some form of digital academic book is probably the ideal. Um, I know that there um, have been good developments in uh, 3D PDFs and things like that, so it is possible to navigate within a PDF, which is great. Um, I haven't quite thought of all the logistics of it just yet, um, but having a website as well uh, for people who can't get access to the thesis would still be beneficial as a publication in its own right. Um, but we'll see about the book. <laughs> yeah, sort of following on from that, how about sort of the, the 3D printing aspect of that? Mm. I can remember mm. doing little sort of poly, sheets of polystyrene and plaster Paris models of landscapes. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I think if you could just switch from the machine overnight and leave it to do it, that would be much easier. <laughs> mm. Now that would yeah. definitely, especially in terms of making public displays more accessible for yeah. the blind, if they want to have a tactile experience, then that would definitely be the way to go. Um, I know someone did a wooden reconstruction of a garden from this period, which is probably about twice the size of this table, yeah. but that is fantastic and you can see all the different heights and all the details yeah. and stuff. Um, but of course the problem with that is you can't switch the layers off, it's just that one mm. example. Yeah. So if you want to show different view shed analyses or whatever, or um, show the progress through different design changes, yeah. you wouldn't be able to do that as effectively. Um, but it would still be really cool yeah. to see it in that. But yeah. I remember when English Heritage as was did their polygons, when they split the country up into polygons and did multi-period things, mm. that they were looking at layers which are prehistoric and Iron Age, so on and so forth, up, up to modern. That uh, the underlying landscape doesn't really change most of the time. So you could actually have a basic landscape and then have sort of like a printed out version that you just crop over the top and uh, visualise it out mm. like that. But, uh, you know, I, I deal with raw parts and uh, have terrible fights with them because they want to. Uh, basically plant things in all the places they shouldn't because they're horticulturalists and they don't care about underlying archaeology. Uh, so it would be really useful you know, to have, if they had a three-dimensional model of say Richmond Park and you could point out, don't do it there because mm. but, uh, it will cost money. <laughs> yeah. You could have a 3D model and have um, in the buildings that match things that's put little magnets in them. <laughs> <laughs> I could just imagine children just going. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I'll just do one of one of my own, if I if I may, just to finish it off. Um, so we don't keep you too long, is it? Um, I was just wondering about, in some ways, about limitations mm -hmm. and, and limitations within that, uh, and and to a degree about how you bridge. And I may have missed that, and you may have touched on it. I don't think you focused on it, but you may have briefly touched on it about the gaps and bridging the gaps and stuff like that. So in other words, you've got you've got a plethora of really, really rich information, but it's not complete, of course. And there are lots of gaps. 
And of course, when you're doing, you know, the visualizations and everything else like that, there is going to be things where you have to fill the gaps. And how have you done that in mm. that sense? You know, because that that is a that is a challenge, not just, you know, that's a challenge for all the historians with, with, yeah. with getting the sources. There's always going to be a gap with the sources. And one has to make decisions on that. Mm. And and has that been a problem? And second, how have you dealt with it if it's been a problem? <laughs> you, you can give us one example if you want or, or not. Do I have an example? Hmm. Well, was it a problem first, I suppose? Uh, I think it was only a problem because I made it a problem. I think <laughs> instead of seeing gaps as limitations, you just kind of have to kind of acknowledge that it is a gap, yeah. but you kind of have to just do what is in your best knowledge to fill those gaps and sure. not spend time and time again trying to think what was there. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to let it go <laughs> and just do what you can. Um, but I think kind of, especially within the time scales of a PhD, you kind of have to say, no, that's enough. I need to make a decision and just go with it. Um, there's always a chance that you can change it later or people will say, no, that was definitely something there. And then you can change it. Um, but yeah, got to do your best. <laughs> okay, no, it's just kind of, in, you know, in the specific example, it's just kind of thinking if you don't know what um, the ornamentation was on the outside of a particular facade or something mm -hmm. like that, do you leave it blank? Do you kind of mirror it with something else or, you know, um, um, or, or, you know, because that, that, we did have that issue when we had the, the and I've forgotten his name, the chap who does the ancient Roman, he had, you know, he was trying to do, build, and he would have no information on one particular building and whether you leave it just as a, kind of a very raw building or whether you put it in as similar to the neighbor or mm. whatever um and that's yeah. kind of where i was kind of coming mm. from well i suppose that's where looking at other sites and seeing comparisons is useful um so i mean with stiff key obviously you've got father and son duo so that's a pretty good basis to compare um so um that's kind of where i was reading through work that someone had done on Stiffkey and saying um, it was an e-plan house but in reality it was actually a courtyard plan and that was similar to Gorhambury. Um, but of course without that link you probably wouldn't have realised it but of course there's now a plan of Stiffkey which depicts this courtyard plan. So we now know definitely that it was actually a courtyard. Um, but yeah, definitely looking at comparisons with similar sites that they would have encountered provides us with a possibility mm -hmm. of what those gaps were. Mm -hmm. Isn't there something you can get here from what the art conservationists do, where they have, have this principle that they do their conservation on paintings such that if you look at it from sort of five metres away, it looks like a contiguous whole. If you look at it from 10 centimetres away, you can see all the bits that they haven't been able to put in because there's uh, nothing, there was no paint there for them to uh, work out what was going on in that area. Mm. And I, I think most people would find that perfectly acceptable. Yeah, oh, that's true. Mm. Mm. It forces you to confront subjectivity, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, you make, there's someone doing a 3D model of the Venice ghetto in the 15th or 16th century. Like, there are very detailed elevations for lots of the buildings. And so they're rendering immense detail on those buildings, but the ones where they've only got the plan form, they're leaving in white. Okay. So it's kind of like the way museum displays now use translucent acrylic mm. to kind of fill in the gaps rather than restoring the object to its original form. Mm. So it's kind of conveying. There's so many subjective decisions you make when you're building this model, as you say, the only way to do it is to, mm. to just accept that. Yeah. But kind of finding a way to convey that to the audience can, mm. can be very useful, especially yeah. if you turn it on and off. Mm. Well, I suppose with this kind of medium, you could have it both ways. Exactly. You could mm. have it yeah. as the full reconstruction in your imagination, and you could have the model, which is the one, yeah. mm. just the stuff you absolutely know. And you could have the viewer kind of looking mm. back and forth. Yeah. That would be fascinating. Yeah. Mm. With the fucking thing, you just press it, and all the, the conjecture disappears, and you're just left with, I don't know, an ad like. <laughs> The, the National Trust gets in, got into trouble with this because they used to shunt furniture around and fittings around to their various houses, which are of contemporary age, but they didn't actually belong to those buildings. 
Mm. And so they had a bit of a debate about whether they should be doing that or not. Mm. And of course with this you can stick in any bit of furniture you like and then just push your button and disappear. <laughs> 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 it reminds me of those books that you get in Italy where you have a, a picture of a Roman ruin and then a sheet of acetate that goes over it that shows this is what it would have looked like. Mm. <laughs> Well, I think we've probably um, challenged and probed and questioned Lizzie enough um, in that regard. I think it's just uh, appropriate to um, thank her once again uh, for, a, for a truly excellent and revealing uh, talk and a great PhD topic. Um, I do hope you'll all um, keep an eye on our website for our autumn um, talks. Um, we're not quite sure when that will be up, but sometime over the summer, and we hope to see you all again um, in the arm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.